Welcome to Art Therapy First Aid, the video. This uh, was recorded back in February before lockdown. And although I am here now in Southeast Gippsland on Bunurong land, and uh, I pay my respects to the elders past, present and future and merging this beautiful place. When we recorded the Art Therapy First Aid video though, we were in Geelong with a group of art therapists from there. And since then, nearly a hundred therapists around Australia attended Art Therapy First Aid workshops, but there were still some who couldn't make it. And this video is actually for you. So I hope that you enjoy it. It is based on the recording from the live workshop. However, it's been cut so a whole day of uh, experiential and art-based process work was chopped down to a little tiny video so that you'll find actually in the video there's a lot of me talking but on the day it wasn't really like that we did a lot of art activities so i've interspersed throughout this video little signs for you okay and so when you see these signs I totally encourage you to stop the video and do the activity, okay? Because you'll get a lot more out of this if you engage in the activities. It really is designed to be experiential. So having said that, what you'll need is just something simple, like an art journal, like I have here, uh, and some things to work in it with. So. Uh, being art therapists, some of you, or even all of you, maybe most of you, I don't know. Just some pastels. I've, they're a bit messed up because I've been using them. Um, always have some markers around. Have oh, just pen, pencil, sharpie. I've usually got some ink because I really like ink and my brushes and things around, paint. Some people like watercolors. And there's a part in this video uh, where you'll be asked to improvise and make up some different activities. So in that part, you can just grab anything at all that you can lay your hands on that you like using and improvise with the materials that you have at hand. But if you just have a journal and some things to make marks with, that'll be a good start. So, here we are, enjoy the video, and I may see you again at the end. If you feel like just placing your feet nice and firmly on the ground or the floor that's sitting on the ground, yeah, and settle into your sitting bones in your chair. Maybe press a little bit just to make sure that you have that sensation of the ground being there. And with the hands on the belly, if we just take three deep breaths together. We're going to start with me sort of offering you or inviting you to participate in some activities that are inspired by other work I've done, okay? And through which I hope that you will actually have an experience of the core qualities that we're investigating together today. And you'll hear them repeated over and over, pretty much like a mantra. And they'll be safety, calm, connectedness, self-efficacy and hope. So I've designed an introduction with experiential activities through which I hope that you will um, experience these qualities. After we've done that, we'll unpack it a bit and then I'll give you an interactive mini lecture, okay, introducing the um, nuts and bolts, if you like, of psychological first aid. So that'll be sort of some information. Um, and then we'll start moving into imagining how we might translate psychological first aid principles into art therapeutic responses and how we might do that safely and creatively. Then we have lunch and then we come back 
I'll give you some inspiration, I hope, and then we'll work in small groups, improvising about how we might do this in community. Okay, and um, so you'll actually design some activities together and then you'll have take turns to um, host others into your activities and then to swap and go around and experience other people's activities. Now what I'll get you to do is to find somebody in the room who you don't already know and have a five minute exchange with them, introduce yourselves to each other and when you come back to the circle, I'll get you to introduce your new friend. Okay? Ready, set, go. <laughs> <laughs> Especially some fabrics, so some sarongs and saris and bits of fabric and that kind of thing. So this will be the time when um, I'll invite you to get some of those things out. And together, all we're going to do is very safely, and I think it does say it on the next slide, we're going to create safety together by making a space. So I forgot at the start to introduce... Um, the artworks that are in the slides. So I'm a, I'm a painter and I've put some of my own artworks in the slides. Um, the very first one was actually painted at Croagingong National Park where I was three days before the fires went through that area. Um, and so a lot of the paintings I've put in were actually painted in that national park. So I'm honouring the places and the animals flora, fauna and insects in the atmosphere in, in the artworks I'm sharing. But this one was actually in um, Nepal and when I was running workshops over there we stayed in a monastery and that was the little monastery garden which was a bit of a safe haven. I just did a sketch one morning and that's what this artwork is and that's why I chose it for this activity. I've started a mandala here very simply with a singing bowl and um, some gum leaves that had fallen off the tree when I went for my morning walk yesterday in Princess Park, which is where I live. Well, I don't live in Princess Park. I live near it in Brunswick. I walk around it a lot. So I collected them and brought them here. And I've learned something this week about um, taking Indigenous materials from the living world um, and, in fact, returning them to where they came. So I'll take them home with me and, and put them back in the park at the end of today respect um, but I'd like to invite you as the music starts just to collectively and intuitively just extend out and create a mandala installation together using some of the things that you've brought with you some of your personal items and with the intention of creating a safe space together
a general picture of your felt sense. Well, we're going to do just some mindful movement together, okay? Mindful movement's lovely because it's um, the love child of things like yoga and tai chi and qigong, so lots of traditional and ancient embodied wisdom practices. But the great thing about mindful movement is that you can just make it up. Mm -hmm. right? It's very accessible as well. But there are some key things to keep in mind. So it's all about working with the breath and also movement at the same time. So let's just once again take three deep breaths together. So really paying attention to the expansion as we breathe in and the contraction as we breathe out. And we start doing our mindful movement and I'll start. It's mirroring, okay? So I'm just going to make one movement for the in-breath and invite you all to mirror me. And one movement for the out-breath. And we'll repeat it twice. Stay together. And we've done each movement three times. We can pass it to our friends and they can make one up for us your eyes rest on our shared installation that we've created together. And when the music starts, I guess you just let your eyes rest and wander. to maybe mind map our collective um, experience. So that's the question for you. Really, what did we experience? What happened just now? And this is drawn, you know, directly from your experience. So this is a bit of grounded research that we've done here together. 
um, just into how did we experience the activities that offered you. My intention was to offer you some things where um, your feelings of safety, calm, connectedness, self-efficacy and hope might be supported. And so maybe if we just have a look at those core principles of psychological first aid and what happened in the group here, maybe we might be able to draw some connections. I really believe that art-based approaches are wonderful ways of supporting the core principles of psychological first aid. And in fact, um, it's not our job to make art about these things, but they actually occur through the act of doing uh, those processes, we're able to experience them. Okay, so welcome to the theoretical overview and underpinnings part of today. Um, as I mentioned, really the workshops inspired by work that I've done and based on the psychological first aid guidelines that were kindly made public by the APS um, and also the Red Cross. So you've all got this because I sent it out to you last week, yep? Yeah? So for those of you who've read it, this will be a recap. And for those of you who have not yet read it, this will be an introduction. But I do encourage you to read it um, from front to back at some point. I have, but it wasn't that hard. Okay, so great. So this is what is psychological first aid. All right. So psychological first aid is helping people affected by an emergency, disaster, or a traumatic event, and it is basic support to promote natural recovery. Yeah. So it's actually linked, if you like, with. Uh, ideas that are really humanistic or person-centred or even Rogerian that we all have within us, given the right conditions, we all have an innate creative tendency towards growth and self-actualisation and healing. Yeah. So what it's not, okay, it's not. Psychological first aid is not debriefing. Okay, so that used to be a thing that um, happened post-crisis, but it's not anymore. Times have changed. It's not debriefing. It's not obtaining details of traumatic experience and losses. Okay, it's not treating or treatment. It's not labelling or diagnosing. It's not counselling. Okay, it's not something that only professionals can do. And it's also not something that everybody who's been affected by an emergency will need. So what's really important there is just to know our boundaries to keep both ourselves and also others safe. So if it's not all those things, well, what is it? So here it is. It is helping people to feel safe, connected to others, calm and hopeful. It's helping people to access physical, emotional and social supports and helping people to feel able to help themselves. So what's probably important for us to know is that there's some people who be more at risk of negative consequences or psychological consequences um, after a disaster. So these might include people who've had previous traumatic experiences, people who've had underlying mental ill health, People who were exposed to events where the horror element was high, so they have seen things that nobody would want to see. People who thought they were going to die. People who experienced traumatic bereavement, so that's the loss of friends and family, and also pets and animals. Yeah? Um, and people who've had serious losses of property, their livelihoods, or significant disruption to their communities and networks more likely to be affected. So there's also people who you may come across who need to be promptly referred to specialised support. So um, psychological first aid is like a little bit like mental health first aid in some ways and it's a little bit like primary health 
first aid in some ways. I'm sure a lot of you would have done training in those areas already. So it's not about um, providing the, the ongoing care and treatment, okay? It's about helping people to tap into their, their natural recovery tendencies. So the people who are more likely to need to be referred somewhere else, okay? This is what these people are. People who are seriously injured and needing emergency med medical care, this is common sense, I think. So distressed that they're unable to perform the basic activities of daily life. And also, or also threatening harm to themselves or others. So in those cases, it's not appropriate to offer psychological first aid or art therapy first aid, but more appropriate to link them with the people who they really need to be linked with. Once again, not everyone who experiences a crisis will need psychological first aid. And these are some of the protective factors. So a good level of functioning, so people who are usually very capable in their you know, general existence. Uh, people who have good social supports, so a good network. People who already have an ability to cope. People with strong moral belief systems, little inner compass, yeah. And also people who have been able to return to normal life. So people who've been able to return to work or return to school or return home. Yeah. So not everyone's going to need it. Sometimes people's existing supports and resources are enough. This is wonderful. One of the most important research findings is that a person's belief in their ability to cope can predict their outcome really hopeful thing to know as well because it gives us a clue about what are some of the useful things that we can do and the clue is that we can support and nurture and develop a person's belief in their ability to cope. There are five basic elements to psychological first aid and they've been drawn from the uh, research and also people with vast field experience and so they're really grounded and they're really solid. So they give us some really nice concrete um, and evidence informed things that we can actively work towards. So they are the elements of psychological first aid are to promote our mantra, safety, calm, connectedness, self-efficacy, group efficacy and hope. They're the elements. So I'm thinking about safety, of course it's really important to think about, well, where art therapists, you know, we do our work and things like that in spaces. So the safe places for psychological first aid is probably a starting point. So where are we going to do it? We're not actually going to go into an area that's been designated by emergency services as um, a danger zone. We're going to go into places that have already been designated as being safe places, safe meeting places in the communities where we might find ourselves working. So there might be evacuation centres, recovery centres, hospitals, humanitarian assistance centres, homes, schools, businesses, shopping centres, airports, train stations, memorial services, community centres and often sometimes sports grounds as well. Those kinds of places. Wherever is already safe in the community. So I've taken these pages straight out of the guide um, because they give you some really important tips and I would suggest that um, you just go through them and use them as a checklist for yourself. Ask yourself these questions. Um, so it's about knowing what happened, so being informed, doing a bit of research, knowing what the available services and supports are for people, any safety and security concerns, any dangers, and then your own physical and mental preparedness. So having your equipment, having your food, water, somewhere to sleep, okay, and also having your own, um, feeling strong within yourself, having your own community and network of support and a system for support around yourself. Look, listen and link. So we're looking, checking for safety, checking for people with obvious needs, um, and checking for people with serious distress reactions. 
people who are really upset, immobile, in shock, um, and and really considering who might benefit from whatever it is that we're going to be offering. Listening, I love this one. So this is just really highlighting the importance of listening. And we practiced that this morning by listening to each other as the first thing that we, we did. And I can't reiterate enough how much of an important part of psychological first aid that this is. We're going to practice doing that more throughout the afternoon. And then linking. So linking people with some of the things that they need, as many of the things that they need that you can. So starting with basic needs, working through to coping with problems, giving information and connecting people with loved ones and social supports. So this is the kind of thing that you would maybe get together. This is the general, um, the broad service system that um, official government supports. So you'll have this, because remember I'm giving you the slides. But then you'll also do research that's specific to your local community where you're going to be working. And you might even you know, have this on your phone as um, something that you can just text straight to people, to their phone, or you might have it printed, or you might just have a flyer so that people can take a photo of it with all of this information on it. I would recommend that anyone who wants to volunteer in a therapeutic capacity Join this group, Volunteer Therapist Collective on Facebook, and there's a lot of people exchanging information on here. So if you ask questions, you'll likely get answers and you'll get linked in with other people who are wanting to do similar things. So people affected by bushfires can access mental health treatment without a referral or mental health treatment plan. But what you need to do is then find out who's offering that either locally or um, who's offering it remotely, so on the internet or phone. Yeah, and make yourself a resource. Get yourself a resource kit, that's the take home message. Get some information so you can link people. Because in Art Therapy First Day, that's part of our job. We're a bridge to ongoing support. Yeah. So the guide talks about adapting psychological first aid. Um, you know, for the context that you're working within, so being aware of culture, so things like dress, language, gender, age and power, touching and behaviour, and beliefs and religion. So I put this example here to show you. This is actually from Nepal, and we made, we did a little ritual type of um, process, a little bit like when I invited you to add in things here, creating an intention. But in that setting, um, we used temple candles, because they're a familiar object. And so people made stars um, with their hopes and intentions and honouring losses and placed it onto this sort of blue paper that we laid out um, and lit a candle. Okay. Now in that context, that it felt appropriate. We already knew the people were working with. We, we, we had relationships. We were able to gauge whether it would be appropriate. Here today, I wouldn't have used candles, and you know, partially because um, there's probably smoke alarms in this building, but also because of the losses people have suffered that have been caused by fire. So instead, I bought a bowl of water. So I just. There's similar underlying ideas, but always adapted so that it feels appropriate. And there's um, just another example of adapting to culture. Just in, uh, in Christchurch last year, where she covered her hair when she was meeting to console people from the Muslim community. So the other really important thing that the guide highlights is self-care, which is great that they've um, put that in there. So it gives you some tips which are really worth reading and things to think about. And it sort of encourages you to act 
actively think about self-care before you do the work. It's like creating some kind of support or safety net for yourself. So I'm going to get you to do one more little activity in your journal for yourself. And that's to just place your hand and trace your hand on a page. And I'd like you to just reflect and for every finger as well as your thumb and your palm, just to put something on your hand about something that's helped you cope in the past and what you can do to say, stay strong. So you can write those things in or draw them or decorate it and just create a helping hand for yourself. and support us well, are likely similar to the things that nurture and support and help keep other people strong as well. And that's a really simple, easy, accessible activity that's probably a pretty safe activity to do with people that you might meet as well. This is the last slide before lunch. So this is the warm-up. Okay, that's been the um, introduction or overview of psychological first aid principles. And after lunch, we'll keep working with those. We'll start imagining and even practicing and experimenting with how we might transform them into therapeutic art-based responses or activities. But I put together um, just a few key steps that I thought might also help to give us something to hang on to. All right, so a little bit of a structure when we're going into something that's a bit unknown. So number one, setting up a safe space. We've touched on that before. So really, if you think about the physical safety. So just make sure nothing's going to fall on you, you know, that um, you're in an area that's not in, under direct threat, that, you know, there's toilets and water. And it won't necessarily be a private space, like we might be used to um, in a therapeutic setting. So, um, but yes, yeah, certainly is there like something really noisy happening nearby? Or is there something really smelly happening nearby? So those kind of things. So then you, let's imagine that you've set up a space where there's some art activities and there's people wandering around um, and you're not quite sure, you know, who's going to be interested or not. So just pay attention. What I often find is that as soon as you do set up something that's a bit interesting and colourful and tactile and creative that people will actually be interested it's human nature. So they'll probably have a look and that's a great time to meet their eye and acknowledge them. Okay. And then maybe engage. So uh, it was actually my mother who suggested this question. She said, I love this question. She's now a retired professor of social work, but she was a social worker for decades and she just always loved this question. How can I help you today? Or how can I help you today? help you today, however you like to say it. But it sets up a dynamic that you're giving the information that you are here to help and you're also asking the question, how can I help? Okay, so it sets up, it's an open question and the ways that people might respond are um, infinite. But what's really important that when they do respond that we listen. So it might be I just need to charge my phone or get some fuel or contact my family and need some clean clothes or a shower or a cup of tea and whatever it might be, then that's what we then offer. If we can meet that need, we offer that particular service, like a um, power plug or a cup of tea, or we might give them an introduction. So we might say, oh, actually there's a, you know, just over here at the community centre, um, Sophie's looking after clothing donations. Come and I'll introduce you to her, okay? Um, or it might be giving that resource or information. Okay, it's like, okay, these are the people who um, people are logging that they're, they're safe and okay with. Come on, we'll check on your mum and dad. Right? Um, and that ongoing information, okay, well, if it's like you really do need um, some counselling in a private space here, I'll help you link in. You can use my phone if you need to. Okay? So once you've addressed whatever they said they do need, or if they've indicated something like they're just there for art activities, so if they're like, oh, I've just got some free time, 
or what is art therapy? Or I'd like some quiet space, or this looks interesting, or my kids are bored, right? So if it's something like that, that's when we might introduce the activities and offer choices about participation. So some suggestions might be, we've got some activities here that might help with feeling calm or hopeful or connected. And then giving them a choice about how they wish to interact or not to interact. Remembering that some people watch for a while or um, just sit alongside or, you know, drift in and out. So offering real choice with no pressure about participation and focusing, in our therapy first aid, focusing on the activities in the here and now. So not the stories of what's happened, but just on the activity that's in front of us right now. We're going to be adapting what we know to work in an infinite array of inimitable settings and I've called that artistry. So this is where we get to use our own artistry and make things up <laughs> in an informed and conscious and caring way but to be creative with some of the ideas. So I put together a few quotes from some of our inspiring Art therapy mentors. <laughs> and this is our very own Cornelia, who is talking um, about using a top down approach to creating safety. And in her book, Cornelia says, The eyes are open, of course. The focus is on positive psychology with the aim of viscerally and deeply informing the client's nervous system that you are safe now. Usually such exercises are considered fun and a welcome deterrent from the client's overwhelming experience on the inside. Cornelia talks about some of the ways that she does that um, in the guided, healing trauma with guided drawing. Yeah. Did you want to add anything? Uh, I mean, positive psychology, for example, would be um, to rather focus on what has happened is uh, you know, what do I need to draw to myself and you, know, you could make a list you know, such as uh, love, you know, hope, um, uh, you know, a friend uh, and, and then for example to create imagery you know, around that. You know, what does that look like, what does that feel like and uh, you, uh, I've even made you know, strength books, I've called them, you know, with clients, where you know, they pick you know, like five or six qualities you know, that you know, that'll be their resources. And, and then they name them, and then they create imagery around that and collate them so they can actually have that as a source to look at. Uh, and it's really helpful to put the focus away from you know, the fear you know, and the overwhelm into um, you know, what do I need yeah? and you know, to actively create that. Yeah, safe place, yeah? That, uh, yeah, creating a safe place when clients cannot think about a safe place. Uh, I give them a toy animal and they create a safe place for that animal. That's what almost everyone can imagine and then we go from there, you know, sort of building. Yeah, you pick that animal, so how about you, you may need that kind of safety. Mm -hmm. That's something along the same lines, um, uh, an exercise, it's really a sort of a doll making exercise that I've done with lots of people as well. And it's like we just talk about, oh, we've all got maybe an inner child or an inner critic, but let's make the inner superhero today. So it's that sort of similar idea about what are, what are my strengths, what are my resources. Barbara Jean Davis, who wrote the book Mindful Art Therapy, um, and she talks about facilitating experiences that are calming, saying, when art therapy and mindfulness are combined, the two methods complement each other. As clients turn inward through meditative mindfulness, they become calm, present, and observing of whatever is happening in the now. Um, and we 
experienced some ways of doing that this morning. And this is also another activity that um, I've done with lots of people and cultivated through my own art-based practice, which is drawing our attention to something beautiful that's outside ourselves and spending some time witnessing that through art making, which people often describe as being really calming. <coughs> Connectedness. I looked to Has Cohen and Findlay, who coming from their interpersonal neuroscience approach to art therapy, highlight how empathic responding, self-compassion and compassion are all part of what occurs as real relationships are co-created through sharing artistic expressions and the love of art. And so once again, it's through just doing the art making in the company of others that these things like connectedness actually naturally occurs. It relates really nicely to that idea of uh, supporting and nurturing people's natural inclination and um, resources towards healing and well-being. And as you can see, me and my friend Ella did some painting together in the bush and we felt very connected through that experience that we shared together. Self-efficacy. -eff so Wayne Hammond, he's writing in Principles of Strengths-Based Practice, and he was saying the strengths approach as a philosophy of practice draws one away from emphasis on procedures, techniques, and knowledge as the keys to change. It reminds us that every person, family, group, and community holds the key to their own transformation and meaningful change process. The real challenge is, and always has been, whether we are willing to fully embrace this way of approaching or working with people. If we do, then the change starts with us, not with those we serve. I selected that picture because that's a participant who gave his permission to be photographed and in fact loved sharing his story about participating in an art project that I did a few years back, working in um, a post-rehabilitation recovery residential setting. Um, with men who were sort of reclaiming their lives after homelessness and um, substance dependency and finding ways to work with them, letting them lead me through their um, creativity was part of what I had to do to, to connect. And hope. The lovely Bruce Moon on the simple act of making art together, making art in the presence of others is an expression of hope. And so sometimes that might even be enough. Yeah. So that's the warm up to the afternoon's activities um, where I'm going to get you to work in small groups um, divided by theme and maybe to come outside and set up a table. And we do have quite a few bits and pieces of materials which we'll unpack and you're welcome to just look through them and work with any of them that you feel um, are suitable. And as a group, come up with a couple you know, of activities <coughs> that might help to enable others to experience safety, calm, connectedness, self-efficacy and hope. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when, you, when I, uh, I've divided you up, I'll let, let you, I'll get you <laughs> to work together for about 20 minutes, okay? Brainstorming and setting up some activities. And then half of your group will stay at your table and the other half will roam around, testing out things at the other tables. Does that make sense? And then you'll switch, okay? And the other half of your table will host your table and those who are hosting get a turn to go around and experience. So you all get a turn at both hosting and experiencing.
I hope that you'll take some time now, whether you've been viewing and working through the activities on your own or with a partner or even with a group, I really hope that you'll take some time just to have a conversation, you know, for 10 to 12 to 15 minutes, however long it takes you, about what was important, what was meaningful and what you personally will be taking from the day and especially uh, what you'll be taking into your work. So once again, thank you.